All right, kids, here we are. It's another episode, episode 34, don't say anything, Ben, of Camera and Flask. Uh, happy Wednesday to everybody, wherever you are in the world, whatever time zone you are in. I am in, uh, I'm actually in Caleb's time zone, central time. Uh, is it ever called anything other than central time? Is it just always central time, Caleb? It's always central, plus or minus daylight. So you don't get like central summertime? Like no, the no, nothing fancy like that, unfortunately. <laughs> and then, uh, Ben, what time zone are you? I'm in central European time right oh, now. So, so it is, it is midnight. It is midnight. It's Thursday. Just Central. where I am. He lives in Middle Earth, by the way, everybody. He's basically in Middle Earth because you're yeah. in Middle Europe. I am right in the very heart of Europe, yes. In, in the, the little forest with the gnomes. Uh, yeah, but it, this is amazing. So I do live pretty much in the middle of a forest. And on Saturday night, I cycled from my little village through the forest for half an hour to a massive music festival and saw the Manic Street Preachers and Franz Ferdinand and loads of other amazing bands. And oh, I had a very, great. very, very wobbly ride home through the forest on my bike alone. And my head torch was picking up all these eyes in the forest all night. It was very scary. Yikes. Yeah. All amazing. looking at me. Yeah. Kind of fun. Well, with that scary. said, <laughs> um, I don't no, know. No, I like this. Uh, so here we are with Cameron Flask. We do this every week. It's at uh, 3 p.m. Pacific, uh, 5 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we'll say that's 11 p.m. British summertime at the moment. And then yep. at midnight in Middle Earth with uh, Ben Barden. And what do we do? We get together with all of these lovely people who are showing up here at the chat. We talk about gear, we talk about production, we talk about uh, running a production company, and we do something else, which to us is slightly important, but is completely optional for everybody else who shows up. It's actually not optional that you're supposed to drink something, but it does not have to be an alcoholic beverage, uh, but we do except for maybe next week for me, because I will be uh, probably broadcasting from a school. So that would be a no-no. So let's start with uh, Mr. Caleb Pike, because you are a kindred spirit in nearby uh, Illinois. And what is it that you are drinking today with your uh, full-frame uh, Sony camera look? Um, yeah, actually, it's the Fuji X-T3. You stepped away, and I, I couldn't find me the a 7 is at a different spot. Oh, so I got sick and tired of that okay. Sony a 6 We're really, we're really like a, kindred spirits today. What's... We really are. Very much yeah. so. So this yeah. week, uh, I, can, I can't zoom in, unfortunately, so I got to do do something else. <laughs> Let's do it. Gonna uh, see how good uh, the autofocus uh, is. Uh, uh, wait a minute. Oh, no, 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 no. That can't be a Caleb oh. bottle. What is this? Why is it so full? I know. Aren't you proud of me? Look at that. You, you bought this today, I presume. <laughs> no. You actually. <laughs> is it backward for you guys? It's backward no. for me. My, no. mother, my mother was born and raised in. Okay, so can you just hold that up for a second? So yep. here's the funny thing about that. So my mother, my biological mother's maiden name was Clark, and she was born and raised in Sheffield. Wow. Right? And I've never seen that. So Clark and Sheffield. Well, also, <laughs> awkwardly enough, this is uh, Chicago, Illinois, since 1948, but distilled and bottled in the state of Kentucky, whatever that means. Wow. So, what were you going to say, Ben, though? I, oh. th that's another thing me and you have in common. My dad was born and raised in Sheffield. Oh, there you go. Okay. Well, there yeah. you go. Clark so this is um, very nice. It's a very affordable as well. I'm still doing that, that uh, affordable tour. So around 20 bucks for this 20 25 and yeah. uh, i would say it's better than uh, everything else so far in that kind of okay. range oh in so that range or just a really nice bourbon it's it's a little more um cuz i've had the evan williams recently on the show and the uh what's the number one bourbon like sale wise of all time uh the white label jim beam, jim beam um yeah. and this is a little more complex than both those so Chris is Cheers. grabbing his Guinness right now, and uh, oh. Bad Karma 714 is drinking a Pepsi with us. 
Um, probably because he'll get in too much trouble if he doesn't <laughs> do that. And uh, what about you, Ben? What's what's in the bottle and going in the glass? Okay, so I'm just before I start that, I'm going to say hello to. Is it pronounced Aurel? Aurel from uh, Plovdiv in Bulgaria, which is a town I have actually been to, and will be traveling to Bulgaria again recently. So to another Eastern European nice. based person, yeah. So welcome to you. Ben always had uh, the best bottles. Go ahead. This. Yeah, let's, let's start All with the condiment floor bottles. Yeah, yeah, here we go. This is a, uh, a, well, I don't know, I've never tried this, but this brewery produces generally great beer. And it's from this little place, which is like a speakeasy. And it's this villa in the middle of town here. And you go into the cellar and there's a little pub, and it's only open Tuesdays and Fridays from 3 p.m. until 5. And then you can buy their beer that they brew but there's no signage. There's nothing unless you know it's there. It's uh, it's, it's off limits. So it's it's great. So we'll try this. It's a uh, the usual non-filtered, uh, non-pasteurized, and this is a Australian pale ale. And I've no idea what mm. makes it Australian. Okay. But I shall report in a minute. We've got Dog Bite Jones at work. He's a police officer, and he's drinking water. I hope so. But thank you for coming to <laughs> love the it. Welcome. Um, all right, here we go. Let's go, uh, here today I went over to, so in, in the fine state of, uh, Wisconsin, you can go to a target and you can buy liquor. Mm. Yes. Um, so I went over there and they had my tomatin, uh, double cask, but they had this called dual chas and it was $22 under $22. Uh, I don't know what this crap's going to taste like, but I usually like wow. tomatin. It's a Highland with, uh, you know, Highland Scotch, and interesting. Never had it. It's young. It doesn't have a year on it. I could have spent an extra mm. twelve bucks and gotten the twelve year. And there it is. It's wow. a little light in color, but you know, let's cheers, everybody. Yeah, let's do it. Cheers. Let's get this uh, episode going. Thank cheers. you all for joining us, everybody. Cheers. Here's my face on my glass for you as well. There you go. Oh, wait, hold on. Let me see. Let me do that again. Come on. Oh, very nice. You see? There you go. Mm -hmm. This is my first time oh, very using drinkable. a... Very drinkable. Mm. Just oh, that fine. Is, that is so bitter. That is the most bitter beer I've ever drunk. Now, I like bitter, but that might be... Too bitter? I, I didn't think I would ever say it, but maybe. Here we are. Mm-hmm. Mm. Interesting. You can go back to the, uh, what's the other thing you had last time, which is like something last week? Something cider. I've got called? another. It was a cider I was drinking last week. It was Aspel's. No, you had something with the word ass in it, but that's okay. We won't get into that. that, that. And, and Caleb, how is it? Oh, you're you're having Good. this Clark and Sheffield. It's uh yeah, very uh caramelly, 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 um, caramelly. It's, it's it's nice. Caramelly. It's really nice. It's a great cheap uh dream as they say yeah good mm. and, and i'm impressed with the uh this autofocus yeah. this is the first time i've done a xt3 uh yeah, baby. live stream yep yeah mm. oh, so far, nice good. Stable. Good. well if you so put it in the right place there it is okay all right kids so we are uh we're talking about the future of lighting this week and that's a big topic mm. uh but i think i wanted to start off by um, just talking about, we, we, we don't really need to get into the whole, okay, we're using LED lights now. That's kind of a, you know, a conversation that we don't need to have. But what I'd like to hmm. do is get each of your take on sort of where you see lighting going in terms hmm. of form factors, in terms of technology, how you might be using them differently maybe now than you were even a year ago and where you see sort of the, the trends and what you're hoping to see. We're all at NAB, of course, so we have some insight into that. Um, and I think I'm going to start, uh, I think I'd like to start with Ben, if that's okay, in terms of some of this stuff and what you're using and, and what you'd like to see and all of that fun stuff. Yeah, I, I, mean, I suppose in terms of what I'm using now, it's, it's really got to be portable for me at the moment. Um, everything from these flyaway jobs right now. So small, small and light is where it's at, but power, that's the, that's the thing that I crave 
is just output from smaller smaller fixtures with huge output. That's that's what I want. Right. So at the moment, I'm using for all this stuff that I'm doing for this oil and gas industry things, which really have to be slimmed down kit wise. I'm using the uh, the aperture light that we talk about every single week and the model number I forget every single week, which is the F7. A, F7. the F7. I always call it the A7. Yeah, the F7. Uh, which is great, an incredibly versatile piece of kit, which is what's lighting me now. I use little bowling, um, the vlogger light. Um, P1. The P1, yeah, and that's great for just washing backgrounds. It's a full RGBW light. Um, so that's brilliant to have in the kit bag just to liven up a really dull space. Uh, and then I use the Westcott Flex an awful lot uh, as a mm -hmm. key light. Um, because that, that's got a, a great amount of power from something very small. Although yeah. uh, I've got the older set, so I'm, just, I'm not completely in love with the amount of boxes and cables and cables into a box and then another cable into another box and then all that kind of daisy chain that needs to go on with it, but still a great piece of kit and gets used all the time. Yeah. But so for me, yeah, the, the, I want more power. That's absolutely always the case. Um, which Westcott really? do you have again? It's the 10 that they don't make anymore. Oh, you have the 10-inch, and, and it's the, the daylight-only one? It is the daylight-only one, yeah. So Got I would it. really, that I will be upgrading to. But I, with lighting, I have been, uh, I suppose, holding off a bit on, on investing in the next set because things are moving so quickly. Hmm. Um, and it, it's, I still haven't got a, a concrete idea about what I'm going to get next, but probably the Westcott lights again. And now that they've, they've slimmed down the number of boxes that you have in terms of the, the transformer, the, uh, the dimmer, it's all in yeah. one box now, um, yeah. much easier to power them off external off batteries now as well. Um, so I don't know, that's, that's interesting, but to me, hard light is still that's great. Hard lights that you can do anything with. You can shape those to whatever you like, but it's just having having the power. So bicolor hard light with masses and masses of output in something that's about as big as my fist. That, that's yep. what I'm after. Yep. Yeah. That, that's it for fixtures. Just... That's do a couple of shout outs here. Uh Kim, Alex. Uh we already said hi to Dog Bite. Um Boy, David, uh, Sky, of course, part time films. I feel Mr. very bad relaxed. karma. I really do feel very relaxed when part time films is here. The grumpy penguin, I don't know what's going on, but somebody's got to get that guy back in here. Yeah, get back, get back on track, grumpy. And uh, maybe grumpy's a little grumpy, and uh, <laughs> you know, who knows? But there you go. Hey, Chris. Um, so as always, please join in the conversation. We love it when you're chatting with each other. We love it when you're talking about light fixtures that you're using. And we really love it when you ask questions because um, that's why the chat is here. So can I just uh, can I answer a question really quickly and we'll see absolutely. if it's gonna work. Go for it. So uh, Larry, I was it, yeah, Larry's just asked me, do I ever run into power adapter issues as you go from country to country? Uh, no, because I have something that I'm going to see if my AF will pick up. This is all going to go horribly wrong. Right, you see this thing here? Yeah. Yeah? So yeah. That, uh, that will take UK, EU, US, and USB plugs. Can you as please well as put, I think can you put a link to else. that? And then can you... Um... Sure. Yeah. So then all you need to do is you buy that with whichever end you you are going to use most often so i have an eu end on it mm. um, that goes into the wall but then i have an adapter that puts that into anything else but then that's one adapter that i need to carry around and everything can run more or less off that or a pair of those amazing so i just buy i just buy a us one and then get a uk adapter plug to put it and it'll do all the conversion and everything mm -hmm. good yeah because obviously that's most gear now will run on either uh, 110, so US voltage running at 60 hertz, 
or sure. European, which is yeah, two two twenty 220 or two thirty yep. in the UK at fifty hertz. So nearly everything will run on both now. That adapter that I've just shown you does no conversion. So if right. I stick that in into the US, that's yeah, going to yeah. be running at US voltages and, and uh, frequency. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So uh, let's let's bounce over to you, uh, Caleb, and just start talking a little bit. I mean, I know that almost weekly, it seems, you've got a new <laughs> light, which is a good thing. And, and you really seek out and find some great low-cost solutions. But we're looking more for sort of um, the lights that you're using on a regular basis and also the trends that you're seeing. Uh, and, and we'll dig a little bit deeper into this later in the episode. But what is the stuff that day in, day out that you're using? And what is it that, like Ben, you're really you know, like you're yearning for. Yeah. Pining in the fjords. Right. I would say it's similar to Ben. I'm excited about the future of lighting in that, uh, you know, smaller, brighter, more power efficient and all that. But as it stands, my two, <clears throat> excuse me, my two favorite form factors are single chip bright, you know, replace your jokers situation, you know, yeah. especially with these, they're not as bright as jokers, but they're, great for these sensitive cameras. So the aperture stuff, um, I'm, I'm really hoping aperture goes by color soon. I'm really tired of daylight and like different versions of daylight. Like every mm. single aperture light I have is in a range of 5,300 Kelvin to 6,000 6, with varying levels of green. Yep. You know, if you, mm. if you use like a spectrometer and get real nerdy about it. Sure. So I'm kind of tired of that. CRI is great. They're great lights. Love them. But it's 2019, as the kids say these days. So mm -hmm. what's going on? And there's Chinese companies like Falcon Eyes that have 300D competitors that are by color. And almost throughout the whole range, it stays pretty close to a 300D output. Mm. Um, so I did a video that pretty much flopped immediately <laughs> about that light. And then flex lights. Um, everyone has one now. You know, Westcott made a huge splash with that flex 10 by 10. And sure. now there's a gazillion. Actually, the one I'm using right now, I, I think Ben should check out. It's from a company called Menik, M-E-N-I-K. And mm -hmm. um, they're a younger lighting company, but in Chinese. But uh, I think they're making close to the perfect light mat. And I think it's just going to get better. It's by color. I'll see if I can grab the controller here. Here's the controller. That's it. Power, everything is right here. So mm -hmm. I've got a beam out on the back. Uh, by nice. color, 23 to 10,000 Kelvin, I think, or something like that. 8,000, give or take. Very nice. Really bright. Uh, in fact, they don't dim down enough, in my opinion. So I use a lot of diffusion on them. But uh, they make several different sizes. Their big one is like kind of like a one by three form factor. Wow. And then a smaller one, which I'm using now, is a one by two. Um, and they're, and they're the cheap spot in terms of the power on on that in the output um, color temperature range. Yeah, so in terms of oh, what it's really even. It? Yeah, I did a right. review oh, on is them, it, and uh, it, and the whole range is almost identical in output. So they regulate the output so that you're yeah. consistent, which I I think is I think is huge when you're talking about bi color or color tunable lights because when you go and do a setup, you might tend to think, hey, I want to I want to start with a, a warmer color temperature. But as you start to build out, you're like, you know, I'd like to cool that up by maybe 500 Kelvin or whatever you wind up doing. Mm -hmm. And then if you start to see a decrease or an increase in terms of your output um, or you see the crazy, maybe I should hit record on this damn thing. Hold on. <laughs> Make sure I'm doing it. OK. Um, if you see, if you see that increase or that decrease in terms of the, uh, you know, the, the output, then you're throwing off your ratios when it comes to lighting and what you're doing. And, uh, and I love it when a company consistently tries to keep that output as close as possible as you're going through that range, especially between 3,200 and let's say 6,000 Kelvin, yeah. which is where, where most of us are living most of the time when we're doing stuff for sure. Yeah. Um, anyway, so they're cool. 
uh, for the new studio, which, you know, no one on my, I haven't talked about on my channel, but I've mentioned here a couple of times, so why not continue? We're mainly using uh, IntelliTech light mats, which okay. instead of like, like bendable, they're foldable. Okay. So it's mm. kind of like, it's kind of like your 10 by 10 there, uh, Ben, but rigid. Mm. And then there's four of them together and they fold up into a one by one. Mm. Um, so the, those, and then aperture large ship. So that's kind of my jam right now, but going forward, um, RGB, I, I think it'd be fun to have less RGB, but RGB. So kind of like what, uh, the Felix has done where you can, you can have that plus minus green. Um, but I don't need like a full on blue, you know, I don't want a, a wall wash situation. I just want to like. Yeah perfectly match any light source I come in contact with. Yeah. Um, I think that's that's really great. And then, yeah, smaller, brighter, more efficient. I'm really digging this whole built in battery thing for the small stuff. Mm -hmm. So like the P1 that you have been, I wish the F7 yeah. had that. It's just grab it and turn it on. Forget it's the brilliant. batteries, forget the chargers. And I know in, but they still offer an external power option. So um, like those little lights, that I've been messing around with recently that are cheap. I love that. Just gaff tape it to a door and turn it yeah. on. No yeah. batteries. You're good to go. Anyway, oh. that's, that's my long answer. <laughs> to okay. Jim's question. Well, it's not that long. No, I mean, th those, I think one of the things that's exciting also is that, um, these smaller inexpensive LEDs that, that you especially Caleb are covering, are uh, tending to be less of a problem in terms of flicker. So they're not only getting better in terms of CRI and color consistency, but I'm finding that when I'm ordering those cheaper lights off of Amazon, that there's less flicker issues than there used to be. Um, yes, and, and a big reason for that is the built-in battery. And this is something I should have mentioned when talking about what I want to see in the future. And yep. that's all these garbage drivers to go away in the household. Like it's a complete poop show to keep things uh, monetized over here for Jim. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> complete poop show when you go out to buy LED bulbs. Anytime you have AC current, so like, you know, outlet powered or whatever socket powered lights, they're all using like, like they're just turning the light on really fast on and off, on and off, on and off because it's LEDs require such little power. So mm. I'm so tired of like finding bulbs or buying bulbs for my house. And when you go like this, when you wave your hand, it's like jittery. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed that or on dimmers? Yeah. Like it's all trash. Whereas well, it, we got it. We got to figure out the driver situation. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's so trash that in my house, I replaced almost all of the lights twice because I didn't like the color temperature. And I'm talking about lights like, Forget it. I don't want to get into that. So uh, when I replace them, uh, you know, when you use dimmable LEDs, you actually have to use a dimmer that's rated for LEDs. It's mm, not yeah. just a regular dimmer. And I did that, and I still have to keep it monetized effing problems all over the place where I hear a buzz or there's occasionally a flicker. And there's one light in particular that is like one of those old Edison giant ones that I have in this really nice pendant light that I just hooked up. And I went and bought an LED, you know, 2800 Kelvin. And it just, even with the right dimmer, quote unquote, it would just go crazy. So I said, F it. And I just went to the store and I just bought a regular, yeah. you know, basically a regular Edison, uh, you know, halogen bulb. I was oh, done. You can with still that. buy those. Yeah, at oh, least over cool. here. Yeah. I, I, I did that for my patio. It's 45 yeah. watts per bulb, and it's a huge string light going across the entire patio. Yeah. Yeah. So when I turn that thing on, it's like, I had a little bug here. It's like yeah. multiple 300 Ds. <laughs> That's <laughs> but amazing. you just can't beat it. It just looks better. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, and, and what's dumb is like, does. this is easier. It does. We're talking like minuscule wattage yeah. here, mm. but they can't figure it yes. out, or they're just being cheap. I don't know. So hopefully, yeah, this will all be history. It'll all get sorted, but I'm just sick of it. Yeah, I think we're about a year away. Um, so it'll be good. So, wow, there's a lot of conversation going on today, which I absolutely love. 
Uh, somebody asked me about the Godox uh, lights, and I don't have any experience with the SL60s, but you do, right, Caleb? What, what's SL60. That I don't have the SL60. I have the SL100, but yeah, okay. everyone's that's a great like budget 120D yeah, without a battery option on right now. Geez, okay. And then uh, just a lot of lighting conversation going on here. I love Chris's uh, comment. Uh, I want a T-shirt uh, with Jem saying, keep it monetized. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've never actually said that, but I, I'm okay with that. I'd like a T-shirt with that. So. Sky London, see the, seen the new Aperture bulbs that you can use in your house. Yeah, it would be tempting to just literally buy all the Aperture bulbs. Put them through, and also the Quasar. Yes. Quasar makes them too. That's true. Now you can go to Quasar and buy. Uh, it's yep, expensive they've got ones that are in, they're like twenty twenty five bucks each. So that's cool. Right, but if you're gonna like fill your house with them, mm. Abdullah is up. tuning in for the first time live. What's up, Abdullah? Welcome. What's up? Welcome. Um, Chris would buy the T-shirt. Well, at least we have one, so we can do a one-off. <laughs> I'll get a hold of Slavic. He's in the t-shirt business. Slavic will get go. me hooked up with a t-shirt that says "Keep it monetized." I think we my need one of those. And another one saying, "I'm not getting, uh, I'm not getting five-axis image stabilization at home." That was the other <laughs> suggestion for a t-shirt that we had a few weeks back. So we maybe need to get a line going of uh, camera and flash. I think there's something with dong, a bag of dongles for sure. Seven dongles down is one of them too. <laughs> <laughs> bag of dongles. Seven dongles down with a bag of dongles. Um, <laughs> All right, good. Well, here we go. We're we're chatting it up here. Um, I'm gonna share. I'm gonna share a screen with you at how stupid my setup here is in the hotel room because this is just ridiculous. Um, so everybody can see this. I'll present it to everyone. That's what it looks like. I'm standing in between that bottle of scotch and that laptop, which is on <laughs> a. Uh, what is that's like a, a long rectangular hassock turned up to be a table. I've got the garbage can behind that with the uh, XT3. Look at my fill. Look at that little gray gaff tape. Beautiful. I know. And you then be uh, so much trouble if when you pull that off, that the, the paint's all off the wall. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Silence. And then I'm looking at it. You can't see me looking at it. And then that's a that's a Luxley cello light going through the center uh, of of a you know like a five in one diffuser, which you can see is expertly uh, rigged by my friend Mike from uh, Wisconsin PBS. Uh, we did this together. And then of course we're using a couple of uh, mini Mathalini clamps. But just please see the fact that i'm not marring up the furniture i'm taking you know beautiful, towel beautiful like yep so just you know you got to leave it in as good or in better shape than you found it so that's all i got for you um so <laughs> that's so stupid i don't even know why i did that but here we go so <laughs> in terms of what i'm using nowadays it's it's really a mixed bag in the studio back at the barn i'm still like my workhorse because it's there and i have this big dop choice you know three foot by four foot softbox there's which is there's seven thousand dollars i'm sure there's a light behind that that i'm using okay but whatever and then but when it comes to sort of everyday stuff the uh the flex uh, mats for sure. I'm using those and I'm still a lot of the time just using the the one by one not the 10 inch but the one by one by colors and mm. One of the things that I'll do is I'll run the one by one and I use the one by twos as well But the one by one can be battery powered and I just to get away from the spaghetti I do a straight run to a, uh, a p-tap battery and I have the p-tap adapter coming from the dimmer into that. And it keeps it very small and very compact. And there are these really big 96 watt hour PTAP batteries that are very small that you yeah. can travel with. And that's what I'm using usually to run the one by ones. So that definitely helps. Um, Fun side note real quick, sorry, totally interrupting. Yeah, no, no IntelliTech, uh, I just got the IntelliTech uh, new pocket like V mount. And it's like everyone has those mini microscopic batteries now. Yeah. But theirs can do 12 amps. Wow. In the tiny little baby one. Wow. Pretty crazy. Anyway, 
Sorry. When, when are you seeing that video? I, I don't know if I'll do a video, but it's it exists. The battery. Pretty sick. I'm glad people got a kick out of this setup here in this hotel room. You just got to make you got to make it work. I mean, you know, it's only what you see on camera that matters. Exactly. Um, <laughs> I've got a little viola back there. And speaking of um, of Luxley, um, they just released a new app, their composer app. And I'm really liking this thing. So this is the app. And you basically just scan for your lights. And I have a cello right here as a key right there. And then in the background is a viola. And then you just go in there and you just basically, you can see I'm just changing everything with the light right now. And uh, it's all working. Beautiful. UI is easy. I mean, I just hooked this up five minutes before we actually started the show. So pretty impressive overall. Mm. Um, so it's pretty cool. And then I can now switch right over to the cello. And you can see here, there's the cello being, I mean, that's just, I'm just going through and mm. doing the act thing. And uh, I think that this is the, the really exciting stuff that we're going to start to get into is that companies are realizing that there's a lot of same as out there. So what happens now when you go out in the field and you're hooking up, you know, two, three, four lights from one manufacturer? And why are you buying two, three, four lights from one manufacturer? Well, I think that that app functionality, the fact that you can connect to and control each of those lights easily, and whether mm. that's Airy on the high end with their Stellar app, or it's Luxly in sort of this realm with their composer app. I think that if you want to be sticky enough that you want people to buy more than one of your fixtures and have that in your kit, then this mm. ecosystem of how you design and you work with your lights with your apps is a big deal. And of course, uh, one of you can jump in here and talk a little bit about Aperture, but I think that they are thinking about that. And before I jump over to you guys, I 100 million percent want to echo what Caleb said about the fact that I'm um, I'm loving what Aperture is doing as a company, but when it comes to the 120D2 and the 300D2, I want bicolor. I yeah. really want to be able to change between tungsten and daylight. That that 2800 to 6000 Kelvin or 6500 Kelvin range, that's the sweet spot for me. And I, I want that little bit of warmth. I want to be able to go 28 sometimes, and I want to go up a little bit cooler than 5,600 to 6 or 6,500. But that's the sweet spot for me. I love it that I can go to 10,000 on some of these things. But let's be honest, and day in, day out production, it's that 28 to 6,500 Kelvin range. Absolutely. That's, like, that's the bread and butter of what we're yeah. doing. Um, so somebody want to talk a little bit about this aperture thing and what's up with that? Or sure. Not? Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what's yeah. your thoughts on that kid? Well, can you kind of give us a little bit of a, a primer if people don't know in terms of what they're going to be doing with their new and actually some of their, yeah. um, legacy lights? Yeah. In short, uh, they have a new system that's a Bluetooth mesh network. And so if you buy any of their new lights, hmm. when the second you turn it on, it's creating a network. And if yeah. you have other new lights, they'll connect together. If you have old lights, you can buy a little puck like thing and uh, this little device and any remote that has that like old school, like tiny travel TV remote. Remember mm -hmm. back when we had camcorders, those stupid little remotes they came with? Yeah. Of course. They're just like that. And uh, if you have a light that has that remote, it will be able to join this new network. So that pretty much covers their entire catalog going way back yep. to the early days. Uh, and now every light can work together uh, in the app. It'll recognize if it's a complex light like an RGB or if it's a really simple on-off dimmable daylight. You'll be able to control them all together, do all kinds of crazy stuff with them. So they're, they're kind of taking... I don't know if another company's really done that aside from kind of the high end, like Aerie has stuff like that, right? Some way to, well, to, yeah, or is it just, do. is it just all DMX? It, so the stellar app 
you can set up a whole kind of Wi-Fi network for it. But I think that what Aperture is doing is they're trying to really simplify the process for the end user. So right. when you're setting up stuff in an airy, you know, ecosystem with their, you know, sky panels and their, you know, L series uh, LED Fresnels, you're really doing that in generally mid to high end production. So you're going to have a lighting director or you're going to have, you know, basically a team of people who are going to do that. That's not to say that you can't use that app with two or three light fixtures. And I'm actually going to do something sometime this summer about that and how you could use it in a, in a smaller production. Of course, not inexpensive, but if you were renting, let's say, two or three sky panels, how would you use that app and how would you set that all up? Um, mm -hmm. But I think what Aperture is doing is really saying, okay, look, we have this you know, low to mid tier in terms of price point and what we want to be able to allow you to do, which makes their light sticky in terms of you know, what people are doing. Um, uh, Oh, are you running this through your hotel Wi-Fi? Oh, sorry, it's okay, Kit. We're we're back on. So I think that um, I think that you know, sort of what they're doing, and then I'm hoping other companies are going to do is really allow you to think about the fact that okay, I've got three or four different lights that are all different form factors, which Aperture is now starting to do because of you know they're doing chip on board mm -hmm. and they're doing panels and they're doing RGB little lights and all this other cool stuff, and if I wanted to just stick with one company, um, it, why would I want to stick with one company? And I think that this, you know, this mesh network and what they're doing, it sounds really fancy and it found, you know, sounds like it, lots of little words and it's granular and everything else. But the reality is, am I going to be able to turn on each of these lights and connect to them simply and then basically control them with an app? And we're mm. seeing that just right here, Without that network, if I'm on the Luxly light, if I'm using a cello or I'm using a viola or their larger one by one, their timpani, I, I basically can just turn on any of those lights with this app now. It'll find the light. I can store that in there. And every single time I turn on the light, it'll connect to it. And now I have control over all of those lights. Well, that makes those lights more valuable to me as long as they are, you know, uh, lights that I want to use in my production. So mm. now um, the, the, the yeah. this app you're talking about, um, yeah. does it connect to multiple lights at once? Yes. Because it sounds a lot like what Aperture is doing with the. Yeah, the I don't know field. really a lot about the, you know, again, we're talking minutes into the app and it's it's light years, right. light years past what they used to have. Mm. Um, but I know as far as I, you can do singles and then you can group the lights together as well. And yeah. so I can basically set my ratios and I can group them and then change intensity. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's, it's good stuff uh, overall. So I'm excited about what this app is capable of doing. Mm. I'm hoping that almost all of the other manufacturers follow suit with their products as well. But that has a lot to do with, you know, how they designed the product from the beginning. Did they think about this ahead of time? Or are yeah. they reverse engineering stuff in order to be able to do it? So, yeah, I think one of the interesting, aside from that over that general control thing, the the aperture app, that ability to be able to go and take a photograph of, or scan another light, or just a color somewhere to be able to control their RGB yeah. fixtures. That's you really can do that. Yeah, you can yeah, do that exactly. with the Luxly. So the Luxly app. The Luxly as well. Well. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I haven't right. tried it yet. And I, I think that that's, if, yeah. if you're matching to something else, and mm. particularly for those little practicals, those little light bulbs that um, yep. the Aperture have, have, are going to be launching very soon, to be able to go and scan another light bulb mm. and then just have that one match it perfectly, that's really, really interesting. Brilliant. Like to be able to like go into a space with an interview with a chandelier in the background, scan to the chandelier, yeah, and then, and then put one of those little new lights they're going to have in a little push from the side. Exactly. And that, yeah. you, know that what I, you know what I would love, and I don't know if it'll be in the app, is I'd love it to do a color match, and then there would be a slider that says warm, cool. Yeah. Because color match is not always what you want. You want to start with matching the overall cast and the color that's coming from that light. So when you're yes. correcting your image in post, it's doing plus minus green. What the F? Phone call? Yeah. 
I'm gonna Is that in your space. Well, I'm just gonna yeah, I'm just gonna mute it. I'll go over and hang it up. So to you, Caleb. Um, what I was gonna say was uh, the amazing thing about the aperture lights is you're getting into this system and this ecosystem, if you will, for mm -hmm. like eighty bucks. I believe that's yeah. what they said. Their their small lights going to be right. I'm not even um, sure. Yeah, I I remember it being about. Yeah, it's about eighty. Like, yeah, so eighty bucks. Maybe the bulb is is cheaper and still gets you into that. I don't know. So I mean, it's ridiculously affordable. Um, yeah, and that's that's. I mean, so many other booths I walk to, and they're like, "Hey, check this out! Isn't this great? Uh, do you want to do a review or something?" <laughs> and it was really awkward because I I you know, <laughs> if Aperture can pull this off, that eighty dollar yeah. little light is going to shut down a lot of companies. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's just gonna, because you yeah. buy that light, it might not be as bright as some of the other stuff, but you buy that light and you're into this ecosystem that is ridiculous. And if they can flush out their line, like if they come out with a, if a quasar style light and a flexible light. Well, and, and this, this, their kind of version of the, uh, of the sky panel that they're, they're bringing out, which a lot of companies are bringing out th mm. those kind of light fixtures at the moment. Really interesting. Um, yeah, they're, they're amazing. But even those little lights, you think that just the, the DIY kind of dirty rigging stuff you can do with those making up like little beauty lights, making up ring lights with those things there's all kinds of stuff you could do with those at mm. really low prices i was i was excited by those probably more than any other product for such a simple cheap thing not simple cheap small thing at nab this year but the other thing that i i'm not a big fan of using apps and i wonder if you then start getting large numbers of fixtures that you're controlling with one like how easy flicking between and if yeah. anyone's you know, well, that I, I would, Bluetooth, I, I would, that's the solution. Bluetooth. Right. Yeah. It, Bluetooth. Well, it is, but, but also panels, that kind of thing is, is kind of interesting to me as well as to what's what's around and, you know, like well, it's something with, this, with, with dials that we can... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That you yeah. can strap around your neck. Uh, just something small that you can... Sh that would be... That would be... So, so one of the things that I'll say is that I agree with you, Ben. I'm not a big app fan. Um, mm. And one of the reasons I'm not a big app fan is that historically, what's happened is, um, hold on. Historically, what's happened with me with apps is that when I've turned them on, they haven't connected and they haven't connected reliably to to the lights. So you know, when you have to launch an app four times in order to actually get something to work, then you You're become right. incredibly frustrated. Um, and one of the things that I, what's up guy? Uh, one of the things that I really love about that little remote, which you're talking about, or we're talking about earlier, Caleb, which Aperture has, which is that little thing that looks like you're, you know, controlling a camcorder, is that it just works, right? Mm -hmm. So, So one of the things that to me is the disadvantage to apps is that you're relying upon a device that you're running your business and your your social life with. And now all of a sudden, unless you have a dedicated smartphone or tablet, which is a good idea, by the way, is if you buy, you know, if as long as they have an Android based app, if you can buy a cheap Android based, you know, small mini tablet, then that's a right. good way to run these things. But if they only have iOS, then you're sort of locked in usually to the device that you're also using for everything else in your life. So I'd love it if a manufacturer would come out with a universal controller that they would sell inexpensively and they would say, here's this controller that you're going to buy and it's $99 and the controller will control one or multiple lights that we are making in our family. Does that make sense? With buttons and pots on it. Yes, that yeah. makes perfect sense. Mm. But the, and the other thing just goes back to the... Yeah, yeah, exactly. With the with using smartphones for this stuff, and you're talking about an Android tablet, and I'm an Android person because uh, I need dual SIM, so I don't use iOS products anymore. Yep. Um, this phone used to be fine. It's not a particularly amazingly expensive one. It's a, a Motorola, I 
remember G6 a week. But the new version of Android got put onto it, or there was an update. And the thing is just, it's unusable almost now. It's you press Oof. anything and there's this huge delay on it, huge delay. So if you're then fine tweaking and it's doing this, and this isn't just me and my particular phone, this has been widely reported across all the user groups. And it, it, but the point being, that the app, there's so much that's out of the control of the manufacturer of that lighting. Yeah. That could be a spanner in the works. So yeah. what James was talking about is kind of a dedicated hardware base that's still connecting in the same way, but that has been specifically designed to do that job is kind of more interesting to me. Mm. Yeah. I think. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I feel the kind of the same way, but it's the future. Like someone, was it Mimo? Our memo earlier was saying uh, apps are not for pros. And I would agree to an extent, like most professionals are using like a DMX board yeah, uh, or even a wireless DMX board over some kind of app integration. But it's going to it's going to move there. Um, so if you're the type of guy who's like, I won't touch anything that doesn't have dials, then you're going to get, you know, it's going to pass you. Um, yeah, but but it's, we're, we're, we're a ways go. out. We're a ways out. It would be interesting to see if there's some kind of dedicated, like you guys have kind of been talking about, like forget the iOS, forget the Android. Um, if there's some kind of dedicated system, it'd be great if there's like an open source like DMX that was more digital friendly. Like imagine DMX mm. with Bluetooth. Exactly. That'd be hot. Mm. But what, yeah. Uh, a guy's basically saying there was a, a sky panel style light at half, to a quarter of the cost at NAB or Cine Gear. I don't know which one that was, but if you know the name, I'm sure. Falconize. It had, Maybe. It had the, the most yeah. prominent that I remember. Okay. Yeah. No, I think I think that um, you know the whole app thing is is a little bit strange. Obviously, when companies are now investing in developing the app, so it's a rich app and it connects quickly. I mean, if you look at Stellar from Airy, I mean, that's hardcore. That is designed for lighting directors and high-end production. But it is going to take some time. But I still don't understand why we just can't have a little box that has a screen and is manufacturer-specific and says, we'll connect to one or many of our lights. And then you're solving that problem. It, it, it can have, it can be running an OS. Who cares? But it's a hundred dollar device that's dedicated to your lighting system. So yep. inside yeah. of your lighting case, you take out the controller, and that is going to wirelessly connect to and control all of your lights. And now that's doing one job. And I would pay a hundred to 150 bucks for that device if I was in a manufacturer's ecosystem. Why aren't we seeing that? And then just because we're sort of in our last, you know, 10, 15 minutes of this. I'd like to just kind of open up the discussion to what would we like to see beyond our current LED technology in terms of form factor, in terms of um, what we can actually do with that. You know, we Hive was interesting because they had plasma, which was not mm. necessarily less expensive than HMI, but it had longevity. So you would basically spend the same amount on the fixture as an HMI, but your your cost over lifetime was much lower but the reality was that leds were taking over so hive as a company started to transition to led they saw the writing on the wall now they're coming out with this very very high output 500 plus watt led solution that they're going to be using um but what else is it that we're yearning for like i yearn for Dato to actually sell their lights at an affordable price because I actually love their little, you know, color tunable dual lens system LEDs. Mm. And I can't, you know, justify that. So I'm going to a Felix light, which is very well made, has great color, but it doesn't have that lens control that Dato has on their LEDs. So what is it that you guys are looking for, both in the chat and also um, the gentlemen here who are my two partners in crime, Ben. 
I'm tempted Hello. to let Ben answer and me run and get my Dato Light knockoff that I never did a video on. That's amazing. Go get it. I'll be right back. Go, go, go. Ben, go. Ben, talk. <laughs> go. So I, for me, it's really going back to what I was saying at the beginning. It's just it's it's form factor is as small as possible with as much output. And hard like, but also then a system of being able to put modifiers on that. Yeah. Um, from from my point of view for travel, that's that's great. So things where the, that's an, a universal system that's Bowens or it's uh, Profoto. I mean, this stuff's happening. I don't think for me, I'm after anything revolutionary. I'm look mm. after you know, that evolution is going on and on and on and on, and Aperture are pushing that forward with these really high output. And in the form factor of monoblock studio flash heads, yeah, which is what yeah, I always I mean, wanted. They're great, you know. And I just want that smaller with more power. Yeah, and I think that the thing that there's a mis sort of conception or misunderstanding, and I've said this before in the show, people think that LEDs don't produce a lot of heat. They produce enormous amounts of heat, um, so that heat has to go somewhere. So there is still a challenge. They're low power draw, but they're high heat um, makers. That doesn't even make sense, but you know what I mean. And so there is a challenge still with LEDs in terms of being able to solve those problems and making sure that we're able to get those fixtures smaller, but get really, really high output out of them. Um, you know, I think that there are still a lot of things that we can see happening. But one of the things that you mentioned, Ben, is uh, is we're really, we're, I'm kind of itching for better modifiers for LED technology. It's sort of like right now, everything that we're seeing that's being applied to LED when it comes to a softbox or any kind of modifier, is taking the concept of what we would use for an older fixture and just adapting it to LED. But right. I'm wondering that if if we lens our LEDs the right way and we create huge output with very broad um, angle of view, basically, or, or whatever you call it, um, degree, your degree angle, then why can't we figure out a way to create shallower modifiers that aren't as deep and still give us, you know, sort of the, the softness that we're looking for. And I don't know if I understand exactly what that math is, but it seems to me that when we're dealing with harder light sources, that's where we have to have a baffle and we have to push through that and we have to spread that light out. And then we have to have deeper soft boxes. But if we can get lenses onto LEDs that are, you know, 180 degrees or whatever they are, why can't we take those modifiers and make them a lot shallower than the ones that we're using for traditional lights? And that's one of the things that I'd like to see in terms of, you know, what we're using. Absolutely. Yeah. Because that is always the thing when we take these, and I've been banging on about small fixtures, hard lights with massive output, but then mm. we need space to make those big and soft. You know, you, we need right. we need space between the fixture and and whatever surface then becomes our key. Um, yeah, so that's interesting. And I think when you see, and I can't, I always forget the name of it, but you know the system, the mirror system. I was just oh, thinking uh, about okay. if you guys had talked about that yet. The seat control uh, CLS, whatever. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. So, so if you reflect the lighting system. system. Yeah. Yeah. So when you start, and and this is basically using a system of mirrors to shape. To shape light and to um, to control it. So you, if you if you then start thinking in that way, you know, can we yeah. can take these small fixtures and then we can make big uh, big light sources from these small fixtures in a way that's not taking up the amount of space that we would assume from the traditional uh, kind of way of doing things. So, yeah, brain bigger that, than mine. Though, yeah, I mean, one of the things that I was saying was that. You know, if you can lens LEDs the right way, you can have very broad degree angles. And why can't we take our modifiers? Sorry, David, I'm putting my hands in your face again. And um, and take what are traditionally much deeper modifiers and make them more shallow. 
And of course, that's the opposite of harder LED technology, you know, in terms of what we're using. And it's creating very, very broad, but high output. And then being able to have shallower modifiers and put grids on those and stuff like that. And I'd love to be able to do that because mm. that would just make traveling much, much easier. What's the Neo you have with you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Pike? The, oh, the lights? Yeah, I'm excited. That's okay, what we're here. Right, we that's go. all on you right now. So does this excited. does this look familiar? Oh, I'm all tangled up here. Oh, it looks familiar. Oh, by the way, um, I'm this twenty two dollars scotch is not bad. Let yeah. me just tell you. Right. Okay, go ahead. That's a dado, but it's not. Are you? It's not. On. This is hundred and seventy bucks. No, it's not. It's solid metal. There's no fan. No. Here's the controller. You're a liar. I'll turn it on here. I'll point at the background and I'll show it, you the the range on the lens. Is it bicolor? Uh, no. The larger mm -hmm. one, I can't recall if that's bicolor. I bought these actually years ago, and I'm not sure why I never got around to doing a video on them because they're pretty impressive. The yellow ring here is the lens. I'll go ahead and spot it up here. Oh, it doesn't seem plasticky. It reads on camera. Oh pretty no, much. it's solid. Mm -hmm. This thing is real, real heavy. No, it's I don't mean the, the build quality. I just mean the quality of the light that I'm seeing. Oh, nice. no, it's um, it's pretty solid CRI too. Output is phenomenal. So this is the smaller, uh, what is this, fifty watts? Okay. And then uh, there's the behemoth right here, which is like so heavy, eighty watt. Okay. It's not bicolor though. No, daylight only. Can we find out um, if they make bicolor? Because if they make bicolor, that smaller light right now, I'll buy yeah. three of those right now. Yeah. I'm buying three of those when we're done. That's pretty impressive. And the barn doors are super legit. Like, they're not messing around. The with things those. that you have. Oh my yeah, eBay. 176 bucks or something like that. Wow. What's the name so. of it, Caleb? Alex is asking. Um, it doesn't have a name. It, it honestly the doesn't. Brand, There's no the name. It's just LED 50 watt. You search. I would LED search for huh? LED LED 50 watt um, Fresnel on eBay, and uh, just look for the yellow the yellow ring. <laughs> Are you asking me that it has no name? There's really no name on it. There is. There is no name. Now I think Falcon Eyes might sell one for more. But if you go to eBay, you can eBay you can find the no name version, um, which is just fifty watt LED spotlight or fifty watt LED for now. Yeah, um, but going yeah, I love this this topic you guys are talking about right now. We don't have a lot of time, but um, modifiers, man. How come with all the crazy tech we have, like physical, you know, give me something the this big, a square that like opens yeah. up to a four by four that weighs mm. as light as a feather and that I can rig up uh, with some of those nano stands we all love. That's yes. where that we, we have to see something there. I, I, it's killing me. I mean, I showed you the jank that I'm living in right now, yeah. but all I want to do is I want to take a light source that's this big and I want to make it into a four by four. Yes. And if the lensing is right, I don't care. It can be this big, okay? Just make it a, a 6 by 6 Fine. That's good enough. Even a 10 by 10 Let's go back to Ben talking about that 10 by 10 form factor. That is doable. I can pack those for days inside of a 21-inch roller. And then can I put that into a modifier that opens up to a 4 by 4 Then I'm fine. Like mm. that's what I want for, for days and days. That's what I really want in terms of a, a system. Um, I have some other ideas too, but I'm not talking about them on the show because I'd like them to be products in the future. But um, I, it, modifiers are heavily uh, on my mind in terms of how we can take what we've been using now for the last umpteenth years, it seems like, and get a little more efficient in terms of taking these smaller LED fixtures and making them into huge, large sources, but easily. So yes. that's that's my wish for sure. Mm. Pitter patter, pitter patter, mm -hmm. Illinois. Pitter patters. Um, 
how do we how do we wrap this up? I want to keep the family happy and uh, and I got to go find some. I'm getting a little hungry with this scotch. So <laughs> what, 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 you got, what, what do you got for me, uh, Caleb? Wrap us out here on your end. Oh and my goodness, we'll put... um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure as always. Uh, some new faces. It warms my heart every time. So I'm glad you guys joined us. Every single week, this goes down on Gem's channel, which you're watching right now, the C47. Uh, make sure you subscribe. Uh, punch that bell in the face. And uh, Ben. Well, uh, I'd like to report back on the beer. It's grown on me. Um, Good. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, mm. that's great. Uh, yeah, amazing to see so many of you in the chat again. That's been really good tonight. Very entertaining. Amazing to see so many new names as well as all our old friends. So, yeah, thank you very much. And there goes my uh, light. Yeah, tell your friends. We've got some new names here. Mike, by the way, says uh, he found a buy color on Amazon. So, Mike, can you post a link right now? Hello. And, um, Guy, thanks for stopping by. And I'm going to have to come up to Washington and do a visit soon. And uh, see, again, I mean, Smog the Cat. Maybe Grumpy Penguin is being replaced by Smog the Cat. And we have uh, silhouetted Caleb Pike. So it's been awesome, everybody. Love you We've guys. Seen it all. And uh, next week, by the way, just a note to everybody, we're probably going to be starting about 15 to 20 minutes late. So that's because I will be teaching uh, a film camp. And it ends at 3 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. So we'll start a little bit late, but we'll end on time. So it'll be about a 45-minute show next week. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. And, Caleb, you're the boss the way you look right now. You're very candid. <laughs> V-mount's gone. Bye, everybody.